welcome to myself, Max McGillivray of Beanstalk. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have another outing of our fantastic group broadcast, Healthy and Sustainable Food Group. Uh, we'll just quickly introduce everyone. Um, hello, everyone. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Mark. Hello, Jackie. Say hello. Hi, Max. Hello. Fantastic. So um, for those watching on YouTube, on Facebook, on LinkedIn or on the uh, on the podcast, guys, can you help me? Is this our fifth or sixth outing? Um, it's of, the sixth of, one. Is six is our, this is a, so the, these broadcasts are so good because um, although we're streaming live, we also get um, so many uh, viewer repeats on the recordings and also on the um, on, on the podcast. And these three expert individuals do so well at garnering some amazing experts as we're going to find out today so let's just give a bit more of a, of a background to the healthy and sustainable food group so these three key industry professionals have come together to create this unique group healthy and sustainable food and this is to constantly examine what would be the results if people from different sectors were to collaborate on solutions to produce healthy sustainable food ongoing and the founders are barbara bray mbe director of alio solutions Mark, Mark Driscoll, Director of Tasting the Future, and Jackie, Jackie Green, Director of Veridas Associates. Um, and again, where these uh, three are, are so good is actually, as well as getting the experts, is nominating uh, session titles, broadcast titles that are so um, in tune, in fashion, and in, in, in conversation as to what we all want to find out. And this week, this month, we're discussing how, as the UK prepares for COP26, the farming and food sectors can work to work towards becoming carbon uh, negative. So, before we start, guys, what, what are you seeing as we as we're in uh, where are we now, just coming to the end of end of um, end of March, on this whole subject of healthy and sustainable food? Um, do you think that uh, we're in a better place as we come out of COVID, or do you think we're in a worse place? Barbara, let's start with you. What do you think, please? I like to be an optimist, but I do think we are in the uh, kind of moving towards more problems. I think we kind of put the worst of the, the pandemic behind us. But in terms of where we're headed, I think we are in a difficult position because there are plenty more people who don't have healthy and sustainable food or don't have access to that readily. So I think there is a lot of work still to do, but we have the right attitude. I think there are enough businesses and organisations who have the will to change things. So I'm optimistic and hopeful, but I do think we're not in a good place to start from. Jackie, views? Um, yeah, I think, as, as Barbara said, there's been a lot of spotlight put on um, food systems and food security. We've also seen, uh, sadly, a rise in the need for uh, Food, food banks and, and support. And so I think there's an awful lot to be thankful for. And there's some really encouraging signs around people valuing the environment, valuing natural resources, ethical standards. But I think that there's still so, so much to do. And I, I just really hope that the sort of unified approach that people have had towards the pandemic can be repeated in matters of climate and ethics. Um, and it, it just I guess it just shows what what the sort of strength of people working together can do. So I just hope that someone somewhere is brave enough to say, OK, you know, you all came together for that. Now let's go after the really big stuff, which is ultimately sorting uh, our climate issues and, and impending doom. So, so, Mark, the ladies aren't being overly optimistic. What's your, <laughs> what's your view, please? So I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic. I think the pandemic has uh, shone a light, if you like, uh, but on the interplay and interrelationships between uh, planetary and, and human health. Um, COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease, so it arises from uh, animal populations as a result of industrial agriculture, as a result of our assault on the natural world and a closer contact uh, between human uh, and nature. And I think it's really shone a light that actually our planetary and ecological health uh, is really the foundation stones for, uh, for, 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 for human health. And as I think governments look towards not building back better, which many people allude to, I always think, you know, take a more positive, we need to build forward better as we rebuild our economies, we really have to reinvest in ecological solutions and tackle issues like climate change, ideal opportunity, UK hosting uh, COP26 in Glasgow later on this year. Well, well done, Mark, if it's, uh, if it's okay to, to mention, I've, uh, we've managed, Beanstalk's managed 
to secure a uh, broadcast with a key individual within the FAO United Nations next uh, next Wednesday, uh, because it's the FAO's uh, year of fruit and veg 2021. So if it's OK, I, I'm just going to pose some of those points that you've made to, to, to them to see whether the, the lights of um, the United Nations FAO can, if they're seen, it'd be fascinating to see what, what, what they're thinking, because it's not that you're, you're not in touch because you're on the ground. You can see what, what's going on, but it'd be interesting to hear it from, from the, their perspectivism as well. And you, you know me well enough that I'm always an optimist. So I'd hope that there would be positivity that would come through this negativity that, um, that, that we've all had. And I think, and, I think, yeah, that's true, Max. And I think, you know, this is a big year. This, we're in the middle of the decade of action. Uh, on nutrition, we have a UN food system summit um, uh, organized by those UN organizations, so WHO, uh, FAO, UNEP, that's uh, due to take uh, place in New York in September, COP, we have the Nutrition for Growth Summit in Japan later in the year. So, so now is the time, now is the real opportune moment uh, for action, let's move from talk to action. Does that make you feel, feel a little bit more optimistic, Barbara, Jackie? I've got goosebumps, so it's definitely working for me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why we bring Mark in, to create the goosebumps. <laughs> definitely. Like I said, I am hopeful because there are things that are starting to move, but it takes time. You know, none of this is going to be achieved overnight. And obviously a lot of these problems came up over time, but it will take time to, to fix them. But I think we're heading, inching in the right direction. Okay. OK, so let's get on with the, the subject matter of, um, of choice being um, uh, as the UK prepares for COP26, uh, the farming and food sectors, can, can we work towards becoming uh, carbon negative, carbon neutral? So let's get in our experts, Ian, Carolina um, and Pete, can you join us, please? So as they join us, so we'll just tell everyone uh, how we're going to structure this. And it's like our previous broadcast because it works so well that I'm going to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with uh, each of our experts for, for 10, 12 minutes. And then at the end, uh, for the last 30 minutes, 20 minutes, we're going to have a Q&A. So if you've got any specific questions for any of our founders or our experts, please feel free to fire them in. Or if you know me personally, put them in on, uh, on WhatsApp. So let, we're just going to go around our experts and just get to uh, the, the name and who they represent. So Carolina, let's start with you. Who are you, please? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Carolina. I work for the Carbon Trust as a senior analyst, and the Carbon Trust is a mission-driven environmental consultancy. Um, I, I sit in an exciting team called Breakthrough. So we're looking at kind of breakthrough ways to further emission impact and, and really drive decarbonisation. Fantastic. Thank you. And Pete, who are you, please? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Pete. I work for an organisation called Nourish Scotland. Uh, what we do is food policy um, primarily in Scotland, but also um, in this year, um, quite globally. So we work on joining up food policies from everything from how you do better work of not wasting nitrogen to how do you provide food security for wow. people in the UK. Thank you, Pete. And last but not least, Ian, who are you? Oh, thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian Wilkinson. I'm founder and director uh, at FarmEd, which is a new um, centre for farming and food education based in Oxfordshire in the UK. And we want to be very much at the heart of local, regional and global agroecological transition, which hopefully I'll get the chance to explain a little bit more about later. Fantastic. And, and in our green room earlier, we, we were just warming up by asking everyone what drink they would have when uh, we get out of lockdown and allowed into pubs. And I think we all want to go to Ian's area because it sounds like he's got more micro breweries and he know, knows what to do deal with. So it looks like we'll be going there for the for the for the pub crawl. So so let's start off with that with Carolina to find out more about her and her work. So if everyone could turn off the uh, video and the audio apart from Carolina. And Carolina, if it's OK, I'm just the, the people on the podcast, um, they love to hear a bit more of, of a background on, on yourself. So if it's OK, I've just got your your background um, here. So you are it's a bit like this. This is your life. You, you'll be way too young to remember this as a TV series. But so it's, it's fascinating when you when you read these out as the background of someone like yourself. So you're a senior analyst in the Carbon Trust Breakthrough Team, as you kindly mentioned, working on identifying a pipeline of new opportunities for the Carbon Trust to maximize its mission impact accelerating the move to a sustainable, low-carbon economy. Your focus has been predominantly on the food and textile sectors, sustainable consumption and production, and carbon footprinting. 
Uh, you also have experience in sustainability strategy and incubation support, particularly in the energy access space, as well as design thinking. Prior to joining the Carbon Trust, you worked for the UN Environment Programme in Nairobi, beautiful Nairobi, crazy Nairobi, on wildlife conservation and youth entrepreneurship. Uh, you also supported the fourth United, uh, fourth United Nations Environment Assembly on Sustainable um, Consumption and Production and the 2019 Science Policy Business Forum on the Nexus of Science, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. You hold a Master of Science degree in Environment and Development from the London School of Economics and Political Science with a thesis on impact definition and measurement in impact investing. How did you find Nairobi? It's just a bit biased towards Africa. How did you find uh, living in Nairobi? Oh, excellent. It was it was so exciting. It's such a melting pot of different cultures, countries, both kind of just across East Africa, but also the world. And the UN is obviously a very fascinating place where, where all those come together and where everyone's really trying to work together towards a global outlook on such such a range of challenges. Fantastic. I'm going slightly off message here, but one of my contacts in Kenya um, was saying he's got a bit of a problem with fencing on uh, on their on their farm on their unit, which is about four hours north of uh, Nairobi. And he sent me mm. sent me the WhatsApp video, and it was a herd of um, uh, of elephants that had come up to the border, and uh, one of the helicopter pilots uh, was, uh, was was filming it. And these elephants blessed them. They they came up to the fence and they just boldly pushed it over and yep. car carried on because that's the way that uh, ele elephants uh, operate. Yeah. So, so, so we, we really need to steer from from you. Um, and please feel free to to treat me as um, as, as um, uh, uneducated, because I think we really need to get down to basics, not not only for some of the people within the food sectors, but we have um, a lot of um, students who, who listen in um, and also a lot of consumers on our Facebook page. What is net zero and why is it important and how is it different from other concepts? Can, can I give you that that? That, that big hairy one to start off with, please. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, so net zero is just one of the many terms that are floating around in the space. Um, another really crucial one that you were talking about earlier is carbon neutrality. And they're often, they're often conflated and then not really the same thing. So net zero itself is the strongest ambition out of those. Um, it's quite strict and quite strictly links to the science-based approach to reaching the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. So in terms of the official definition, it's basically about achieving a state in which the activities of a company's whole value chain have no net impact on the climate in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And that's achieved by reducing greenhouse gas emissions over time in line with a 1.5 degree pathway and then balancing the impact of any remaining greenhouse gases, because not all of them will be removed from, from most supply chains with appropriate carbon removals. So in terms of how that's different, for example, to carbon neutrality, carbon neutrality requires a company to quantify and measure their um, carbon emissions. And this could be either at a company level or at a product level or at a whole value chain level, but there's no rule as to which one it necessarily is. And it also does require companies to put an appropriate strategy in place to then address those emissions. But it basically um, allows companies to just offset the emissions that they have measured. So to summarize the difference between the two, net zero carbon is, is the more ambitious approach. It covers all scopes, so it covers the entire value chain. Um, it is always in line with a 1.5 degree trajectory and it often takes quite long to be credible because it does take a lot of time to achieve that. While carbon neutrality can be much smaller in scope and an impact and it can very much kind of be reached along the way to, to net zero. But it's a bit, a bit less specific about what it really means in terms of the scope um, of the target. Fantastic. If you, I, I think we, we've just had the ideal masterclass definition there on, on that. So thank you. The Carbon Trust, who are you? Yes, um, so I mentioned we're, we're a mission-driven company. Our mission is to accelerate the move to a sustainable, low-carbon economy. So what we do is we work with a big range of stakeholders. We work with um, um, experts in the, in the financial space. We work on green finance and what real green outcomes okay. are in the finance space. We work um, on developing low carbon technologies and solutions um, in the energy system, kind of building the foundations for a, for a new energy system. And crucially, we work with corporates and with governments in helping them align their strategy with climate science and with the Paris Agreement and all the targets that are being set. So very much what, what we were all just talking about in terms of how, how do we get 
different sectors, different different parts of the economy to um, a, a carbon free future. Um, and we do that across sectors. So agriculture, farming is is one of those, but it's it's many more. Yeah, well, well done. Because I was I was going to I was going to ask you to be specific if that was okay. In, in, in what way are you helping um, ag ag businesses and uh, and, and fresh food, food businesses? Are, are you able to give us any examples? Yes, absolutely. So I guess um, in terms of the specific way that we're helping them set strategies, it's normally almost like three parts. So there's the measurement, then there's the analysis of, of what's been measured and then there's the setting strategies and targets of how to actually achieve that. Um, so on the measurement side basically it's about understanding where do carbon emissions lie um, this can include just certifying those measurements as well but it's just lying, laying this basis for prioritizing action. So this is looking at organizational footprints bringing together data from across the supply chain to really understand the, the supply chain level footprint um, and we do that with a range of, of, you know, big global companies. And then on the analysis side, it's about understanding where are the hotspots, where are the risks, the biggest contributors. And in the in the food and, and farming space, there could be, you know, land use change, fertilizer use um, and so on. And then lastly, it's about understanding what are the steps to take to address those. Yeah. And, and do you find that some uh, agriculture and food companies uh, are are they open to change? Are they open to advice, um, expert advice from yourselves? Are you finding any resistance? No, very much so. I think it's a it's a very interesting um, space for this kind of work because it's an inherently tricky space. You know, the emissions profile yeah. of the agriculture sector is very complex. Um, you heard nitrogen application mentioned earlier. I think it was Pete. So the emissions from the agriculture sector are, are much broader than the than you know the the carbon dioxide, what's which is the most common one, and also the the global warming potential of a lot of the emissions are yeah. um, are huge. They're ten to a hundred times more than um, carbon dioxide. So I think it's a it's an, a particularly important sector actually for this kind of work and for quantifying some of these elements. And we'll probably come uh, on to it with, the, with some of the gentlemen earlier. One buzz term that I've heard more and more over the last six months is regenerative agriculture. And I haven't just heard it from, from the UK um, and I haven't led it, but when I've hosted um, uh, events such as this in, in the States or South Africa, this term keeps on coming up, regenerative agriculture. And when I've, when I've pushed them, when I've probed them, I said, well, what do you mean by that? Are, are you just being jingoistic or you've been genuine? And they all do seem to be incredibly genuine, that they all do know that there's a, an issue here that we need to change. But if anything, they need the tools to help them assess. And as you, as you said very eloquently, trying to find the hotspots in particular sectors mm. and, and majoring on that um, and initially. So, so could... could um, um, agricultural and food companies could they come to yourselves could they come to the carbon trust could they come to your website to get generic advice or, or do you want to do more with our with our sectors and as, as an example we did a, a broadcast earlier this week with um, uh, a great contact at the world obesity F uh, federation which is as the title states trying to uh, uh, do more to stop obesity and actually get obesity classified as a, as a disease and they'd love to have more interaction with the fresh food sectors because obviously if we're eating more fresh produce that's going to do us better than eating rubbishy sugar food in terms of obesity are you you looking to have links with the agricultural and the, and the fresh produce sectors UK Europe um, internationally yes absolutely so we we do um, we do have resources that kind of high level you know general advice on our website but I think what's much more interesting is to really work on kind of a direct project basis on the specific case for each company because I do think that in the food and farming space Every, everyone's situation is slightly different yeah, and mostly. primary data is such an important element to this. Um, so, yes, absolutely working really with, with the food and farming um, uh, space is, is so important to really get, get those primary data points and really understand what the impact is of every single player. And is, is this going to work? Are, are we going to see this this net neutrality um, at, at some point in the future, or um, I'm, I'm going to put my Donald Trump head on? Don't don't um, don't shoot me, Carolina. Um, but are we just are we just barking into a wood? What do you think? Um, I, I mean, <laughs> I do think it's going to work. Um, it would be important for me because that is that is what I work on. So <laughs> yeah. I re really do believe that. And I think there's obviously a few a few barriers and challenges that we have to overcome. Um, but I think so much is happening in the space and so much progress has been made. So I do really believe that, that yes, it, it can happen.
Fantastic. Pete, can you come in? Carolina, you, if you can just stay there. So, so Peter, it, it's a great transition to have uh, you come in and I'll just give you, you give you your big rah-rah introduction um, in, in, a, in a moment. But Peter, I'm just going to put the ball between the posts and uh, let, let you kick it. Do you think that uh, having the involvement of the Carbon Trust within our sector of agriculture and, um, and fresh produce, do you think it's important to have the likes of Carolina and, and uh, the, the Carbon Trust involved with our sectors? I think it's absolutely vital that you get um, science-based organisations that can do some of the reporting and verification work that's needed for this because, you know, everybody wants to move in a certain direction and people make claims about carbon neutrality, about net zero, about what they're doing. Um, but if you don't have any standards or benchmarks or way of verifying that, you know, it just becomes a bit of a sort of advertising slogan thing. Yes. So organizations like the Carbon Trust have done fantastic work on actually trying to nail down, what do we mean when we say this? Let's be clear about this, you know, and, and so that when, when companies make claims, they're actually robust claims. Otherwise, it just, it diminishes the whole thing and people just say, oh, it's all a load of rubbish and they stop believing in it. You know? yeah. Fantastic. What, 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 what a great positive um, statement. Uh, Carolina, thank you very much. If you could turn off your video and audio and we'll bring you back in for the Q&A uh, later on. And anyone, if you've got any questions specifically for Carolina uh, later, uh, fire them in now so we, we can post them over, over to her. So Carolina, if you could just turn off your video, that'd be fantastic. Um, and Pete, let's, uh, let's just give you your, your background. So you have a background in community development and social policy. As executive director of Nourish Scotland, you're responsible with the board and staff team for focusing Nourish Scotland's work where it can be most effective. This includes engaging with policymakers and stakeholders, as well as working for change in the bottom up with grassroots groups, as well as, as, well as working at Nourish, uh, you run, you're going to have to help me with the pronunciation, Pete, Whitmuir Organics with your perfect. partner, Heather, he Heather Anderson. Did I, did I get that right? That's perfect. Absolutely perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So part-time farmer, full-time food policy person. Yeah. Fantastic. So, so you are one of our experts. Why, why, why do you think the, um, the likes of Mark, Jackie and uh, Barbara were keen for you to come in? Oh, uh, just to think because um, I've known Mark for a while and yeah, what, what we try to do at Nourish is to sort of work across the system and combine this really sort of proper grassroots stuff, working with communities and the global stuff and try and join the dots. And wow. I think that's something which, um, you know, that's that's what we do that's interesting, I think. Fantastic, Peter. It's probably a conversation for another time, but I do find that there's this uh, big um, uh, 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 break between smaller businesses and, and large. We, we try to contact the likes of the DTI, which I think are a fantastic organisation, but they don't want to talk to you unless you're 10 million pound turnover. Um, and all we're hearing at the moment is about innovative startups. And you wonder where they can get that, that sort of information, um, especially in uh, areas, let's call it rural areas such as yourself so just give us a bit more of information about nourish scotland if you can and it, and it goes with that saying we'll put all your tags um on this uh, on, on this recording and uh, at the end of the podcast what is nourish scotland please sure so we were going seven or eight years we're a scottish charity based in edinburgh when we had offices and in, in the old days and we're we're basically set up our sole purpose is to make the food system fair and more sustainable that's what we do um we're basically food policy wonks. Uh, we work a lot with local government, we work with national government. As I said, we also build um, the movement in Scotland with the community groups, the small scale producers, but we also work with the big retailers and, and the big caterers on, if you like, trying to get that whole system to shift to a more sustainable pathway. Wow, and are you succeeding? Yes. Very yeah, I mean, we're not succeeding on our own. It's not our responsibility, but but as Carolina said, there's been a, more change in the last five years in, in the food system than certainly in, a, in 20 years before that, because, because of climate emergency, because of the nature emergency, and because of the public health emergency, you know, food businesses have completely shifted their view of what the future looks like and the depth of change they need to, to do. And they're ahead of national governments on this. Local governments are getting there but national governments are lagging behind. So COP26, food, is it, is it on the agenda? No, well, it's not the agenda in terms of UK government's priorities at the moment. Um, they've tucked it really under nature-based solutions. Um, they put sustainable agriculture in there, but there's a real danger of looking at agriculture in isolation from the rest of the food system, because obviously farmers grow what people eat, what people eat determines what farmers grow. 
we've got to change what people eat as well as what farmers grow and how they grow it. We've got to tackle food waste. And there's just too little emphasis at the moment on food systems in the COP agenda. OK, does that disappoint you? Um, yeah, we're trying to change it. We've been writing to UK government and trying to get people around the world to write to UK government to get it further up the agenda. Um, it's an unavoidable challenge. Food accounts for whoever you believe between 26 and 33% of global greenhouse gas emissions. If you're trying to solve a problem and you're ignoring a third of it, then you're missing a trick somewhere. Yeah. So there's an obvious problem that they're missing here. Um, and people will put the link to COP26 on this uh, on this broadcast re re recording. But just, just for the likes of the students, can you just give a bit? And I'm not asking you to be the marketing manager for COP26, but how would you describe it to, to someone who wasn't um, who wasn't fully aware of it? Sure, sure. Well, it's it's an example of an effort to have global governance of you know a really key issue. It's been around um, what well, it's always called COP26. There's 26 meeting of the conference of parties. So all, nearly all the member states, UN are members of, of, of that conference, which is about committing to tackle climate change. Um, it meets every year, it negotiates on climate finance, on trying to set the global rules for how to tackle climate change. Um, this year, there'll be a huge emphasis on um, how the financial sector um, deals with climate change. Big, there's been big movements, as you know, with the Bank of England, with other central banks on due diligence, essentially, what's the money doing in the system and how is the money driving um, climate change and how can we stop the money driving climate change? Um, so all banks have got to look at what's the risk, what's the climate risk to the way they're investing their money. So what's been the really biggest shift in the last five years has been the banks, the investment community since Paris have started to see that they need to invest differently. Um, and that's why we've seen, you know, the, essentially the end of coal. Correct. And, and it's a, uh... We, we did a, a broadcast uh, a couple of weeks ago with a, um, a, a chap who's an, an expert in agribusiness and fresh produce investment. So if you wanted to buy an agribusiness or a fresh produce business, and it was fascinating what um, he was saying that um, after the last recession, a number of these funds um, piled into agribusiness on an international basis because yeah. they could see it was, um, it was a safe haven. And exactly the same is happening again as we hopefully come out of the, the pandemic. So we've, we've used this expression, um, uh, Pete, on a number of uh, uh, previous broadcasts about driving societal change. And if we can drive societal change in the respect of the funding, if that's uh, funding coming in, if it can be to, uh, to, to lower uh, the, the, the carbon uh, element footprint gain neutrality that's that's going to be for the for the for the good you'd um you'd, you'd hope so you're are you are you convinced that um cop 26 is is more than a talking shop that it actually will do some good um it's quite hard to find the right metaphor you know cop 26 is like you know wedding day you know what what makes the wedding work isn't the day it's what happens afterwards and what happens before well, um sure. you know and, and you have a lot of um you know very expensive cake but actually the, it's only a ceremony. Um, so, and, and people will make their vows, but the question is, will they keep them? You know, so, so we, you know, we shouldn't get too excited about the event. I mean, it's going to be a fantastic global event, don't get me wrong, and we're, we're doing a lot of work to make sure that the voices of cities and farmers are heard at that event. Um, but, you know, this is a long-term game, and, you know, we, we have time to tackle climate change and to restore the planet. We just can't hang about much longer. Yep. And is there anything that we can do as a, as a group and everyone listening in or on the records, is there anything that we can do specifically to assist you with uh, with COP26? Oh, wow. <laughs> in terms of the, the fresh produce sector, yep. the, yeah. The way we like to talk about it is that we think that farming, agriculture, food production is in a phase change at the moment. And in the 19th century, for military historians, we went from having wooden boats where the guns went out from the side of the ships to steel boats where the guns went, you know, in front of the ship and the back of the ship, right? And the question is, what happened in between in the 30 years when they were getting the changeover? And the answer is a total guddle, to use a good Scottish word. You know, lots of things went wrong in that process while one system sort of came to an end and the other system came to the front. And we're in exactly the same position now with the food system, that we've, we've had a max calories approach um, in response to population growth, in response to, you know, what we knew how to do. And we've had max calories and that's led to, you know, extractive farming. It's led to overconsumption and waste. It's, it's been an approach which has served its time now. And it's like the wooden ships with the guns outside. 
that's got to phase out in terms of a, a nourishing people and looking after the planet approach and repurposing the food system to do that job. So we're asking the food system to change the job it does. And that's going to be, you know, 30 years of a phase change. And in that, the fresh produce sector has a key role because what we know is that globally, we need to be eating more fruits, vegetables, and nuts and whole grains. We need to be eating less ultra processed foods and we need to be eating less meat. So the fresh produce sector has got a real job to sustainably produce the food that we need to keep us well, you know, with a, an increasing population um, and a population that we're still not managing to nourish, despite the fact that you know, we have the technology to grow as much food as we need. Uh, Pete, thank you. It, it is fascinating because I'd be interested to see when we get to the Q&A bit. Um, I, I just fear there's a bit of a disconnect in the respect of um, fresh produce uh, companies uh, globally, not not realizing the potential that they've got in the respect of uh, 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 stopping, nullifying uh, obesity, helping uh, the, the likes of this carbon target. Um, and as, as you say, driving forward the, the, the agenda, agenda in a positive manner on COP26. And, and just, be, just before we finish our uh, catch up, the Glasgow Declaration, um, I did want to bring, bring this up. Could you just explain to everyone what, what the Glasgow Declaration is, please? Yeah, no, absolutely. We've asked cities around the world and regions, sub-states, to, to sign up this declaration, which basically says we are committing to having a, a joined-up approach to food policy as a way of tackling climate change. And that means tackling healthy diets, it means tackling food waste, it means tackling, it means trying to do procurement so we buy from sustainable agriculture. We've got at the moment about 40 global cities signed up to that. By the time of the COP, we'll have several hundred signed up. And it's really because cities are where people experience their food culture. That's where you go to the pub. Cities have a huge impact on what people eat, what people say about food, what people think about food. They can use those powers. And often it's the cities that are at the cutting edge of change. And if we're asking people to change their diets or change the way they waste food or change their food behaviors, often it's the, it's the cities that they trust most. People trust local government more than they trust national government. So if your local government that you have interactions with every day is saying, could you do this? Could you do that? Could we work together on this? That's how we're going to get change to happen. We can't just get it from the top down. Wow. What, what a masterclass. Ian, can you, can you just uh, come in, please, so we can move over to, over to yourself? So, so, Pete, generally, are you, I'm going to slightly um, lead my witness, but are you generally optimistic? Um, I, we, we're going through this big change, but are you optimistic that 10, 20 years out in the next generation that these changes will have occurred, that the ones that you're fighting for? I think, yeah, I think within 20, 25 years, we'll see a very different food system and a very different world. Okay. In a positive manner? In a very positive manner. And that's because you only have to meet so many young people on working this agenda to sort of see the creativity and the energy and the passion and the drive these people have got. I think, you know, the future is safe. You know, I just think, you know, sometimes uh, I'm not saying we need to get out of the way and let the young people do it. But I think we, we need to have that same optimism and can do that a lot of our young people have got at the moment. You know, a future, a net zero future isn't a hair shirt future. It's a future where we have, you know, cleaner streets, quieter streets, warmer homes, you know, cleaner air, cleaner water. And but it's also got to be a future where all of us can get to eat good food and not have to worry about where the next meal's coming from, whether we're living in, in the UK or in Indonesia. You know, we all have to have that secure future in terms of food. T totally agree. And, um, and as per example earlier of um, Carolina, if, if we've got more Carolinas on board, I, I bet the Carbon Trust, they, they must be so so happy they've got the likes of her and her colleagues uh, on board to create create that future. Yeah, you'd hope the future is, uh, is bright. Ian, are you positive? Yeah, I, I am actually. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm. I'm very positive. I think. I mean, moving on to what we can do. You know, it, it seems to me. I mean, Pete, and Carolina have set the scene perfectly, and and I, and I very much um, agree with both of their sentiments and words. Um, I love that Scottish comment, Pete. Uh, can't remember what it was that that name sort of gobbled me something or other, yeah. but that's sort of you know is a nice way of putting it. I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic. I mean, gosh, there's a lot of work to do. You know, don't underestimate how much change there's going to be. But um, I meet people like the rest of the crew on the, on this this afternoon. You know, wanting to change. You know, being inspirational, doing different things that will lead and present a different vision because we know what the problems are. You know, we know we know exactly what they are. The question is, what do we do about them?
Well, well said. Um, and Ian, we, we mustn't uh, f- forget for everyone uh, listening and also for the podcast, I've, I've got to give you your big rah-rah, if that's okay. So, so do you remember, uh, this is your life? Vaguely. I'm not that so, old. Uh, oh, uh, so I'm going to give you your, your book here. So here we go. Ian studied farm and grassland management at Berkshire College of Ag and joined Cotswold Seeds nearly 40 years ago. It's a family business uh, based in Morton and Marsh. And Cotswold Seeds has built its reputation on developing forage, herbal lays, green manures and complex seed mixtures, as well as providing advice to customers, which now number 15,000 farmers and landowners across the UK. At the Helmers MD, Ian's developed the business with a fundamental focus on the role of providing an information bridge between farmers and the scientific community and has been involved in a number of ground breaking research projects. These include the multi-million pound EU funded Legume Plus with key objectives to investigate how bioactive forage legumes, in particular Sanfon and Birdsfoot Trefoil can improve protein utilization and ruminant livestock farming. It's always been part of Ian's vision to have a farm and seven years ago, Cotswold Seeds acquired Honeydale Farm, 107 acres in the Cotswolds. Oh, sounds beautiful. Ian is director and founder of Farm Ed, an exciting new centre for farm and food education, which opened in 2019. Farm Ed's mission is to accelerate the transition towards regenerative farming and sustainable food systems by providing space and opportunity for inspirational education, innovative research, practitioner-led knowledge exchange events and personal development. Through the Farm Ed programme, it will seek to stimulate debate and discussion to inspire and inform. Events at Farm Ed attract representatives from environmental organisations and wildlife groups, water authorities, farmers, scientists, academics, policy makers and politicians. Um, Ian, can I let you into a little secret? Go for it. I, uh, I started off in, uh, as a grain trader for, for a business I, I, won't, uh, I won't mention. Um, and it was a fantastic business. And it's, it's now been consumed by um, a multinational. It's now part of the, the Frontier Group. L- l- researching your background and seeing what you've done. We did none of that. We, we were just capitalist. Don't say pigs. We were just we just wanted to sell as much to, to Mr. Farmer and make as much money out, out of them as possible. We weren't really con- uh, con- concerned as to where we were going on an environmental basis. I'm sure that's all. Of course, it has all changed now because of. of of people like yourself. Why are you different to perhaps the characters that like, like me of all? What, what gave you your magic dust to actually go down this environmental route, please? Well, it's a great question, Max. Look, I, I'm, um, I'm in the, just started the second half of my career. And I think the thing to, to note is that I'm, a, I'm also a product of capitalism. So I, I started off wanting to succeed in some way in, in, within agriculture, and I wasn't from a farming background. So yeah, I went to agricultural college, and I figured that you know the only way in for me was to, uh, as you did, was to go into a su- the supply sector. So I became a seed merchant, and actually, you know, with hindsight, um, and I, I've witnessed you know lots of small organisations going into the hands of the large corporations. And in many respects, some of the seed businesses have done that too. But we remain totally independent, and I'm so glad we did because. Mm-hmm. You know, having had so many years speaking to um, thousands of farmers, literally, you know, I've, I've, I've been able to see some really good things. And the one thing that I really like is small, you know, local, um, personal businesses, because it, I'm not saying, you know, artisan or it just, it just like the fact that people are the businesses. And so as I've sort of got older and as things have become, you know, grown over the years gradually, the, the, we've been in a, in, a, in a really odd position where, you know, yes, we're a product of capitalism, but also comes with that responsibility. And it's that responsibility that we're now trying to exercise here at Farm Ed. So, and, and why, what, what created Farm, Farm Ed? Because you, you could have just gone down the route of being uh, the, the seed merchant and doing good. So what was the catalyst that created Farm Ed? Well, I suppose, I mean, we did originally, you know, about 10 years ago when we were looking to, because we would learn so many good things. I mean, some things to remember, there were so many brilliant ideas that we were coming across that we'd seen. And um, we wanted to focus in on those. And so, yes, initially, from a seed business point of view, we thought it'd be great to demonstrate these wonderful things. But as soon as we started on this road with the farm, um, we realized that all sorts of people were wanting to see what this, uh, you know, the, these complex mixtures would deliver in terms of carbon sequestration what these complex mixtures could do in terms of, um, you know, fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere instead of, um, you know, bringing, importing it in from, say, India in the form of ammonium nitrate. And there, there was, as, as I think Pete said, you know, that there's been this tremendous change within the last decade. And we would not have been having this conversation 10 years ago 
And I suppose, you know, in life, timing is everything, isn't it? And, and it just feels to me like at the moment, this, we're moving away from this extractive, synthesized form of agriculture, yep. which is incredibly uh, destructive, to a new vision of a, uh, a, a biological, more harmonious uh, form of agriculture, which I'm hoping that all of us individually will support. And that's what will change the game. Um, so I think the yeah we we change very much from thinking quite locally in terms of our own seed business to actually realizing that the key to climate change, the key to biodiversity loss, and actually the key to a new economic was agriculture. Yeah, yeah, and 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 Pete did this masterclass and his uh, little interview about uh, stating that he's actually very positive about the future and how we'll see this generational shift towards eating more healthily. Um, Ian, you're, 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 you're in the, um, in, in the, uh, in the wheelhouse, as the Americans would say, in the respect of uh, growing the, those plants. T tell us, you're a plant man. Tell us how plants are, are actually going to help and how, how can the crop rotations build um, soil fertility? Uh, we, I, I use this, uh, this, I was going to say glib expression, but this expression that's coming out more and more about regenerative um, agriculture. How can plants help? Well, it's it, you can sum it up in one word, photosynthesis. If you're talking specifically about carbon dioxide and how we might get that out of the atmosphere into somewhere else, well, look no further than plants, because, of course, in the process of photosynthesis, you take CO2 and you turn it into carbon in the soil. So those sort of plants, the green stuff on the surface of the soil is just the tip of the iceberg. What we stand on on the surface of the soil, if we're in a, a crop, is probably only 10 or 15 percent of the carbon that's actually in the soil. And if you look at the soil's potential as a carbon sink, it is huge. You know, I mean, you know, worldwide, 50 percent of all land is farmed in one way or another. In the UK, certainly it's more a lot more than that. 75 percent of land is farmed. So if we make changes on that land to sequester carbon, we can have a huge impact. Very easy to let it all go, by the way, as you know, as we've been doing. I mean, none of us intended any of this. We all thought production, the yield was everything. And through the last decades, yep. we've been singularly successful in producing a lot more food. But we've also released a lot of carbon in our sector. So it's a question of what do we do? I suppose, you know, we need to think, and I think, I'm sorry, it's Peter or Karina, I can't remember, but you said about, um, you know, it wasn't just carbon dioxide, and it isn't, you know, there's nitrous oxide, uh, which comes as a result of fertilizers, there's methane, of course, which also comes as a result of some, um, some types, by the way, I should say, and stress of animal farming. Not all farming is, you know, can be, can be, you know, you can't say the same thing about every type of farming, not every type of farming is bad. There are some really good types of farming that might on the face of it appear to be em emitters, but you couple all those together and you increase the diversity within farming, yep. you actually solve so many problems, including carbon sequestration. Yeah, and, and there's a big piece there, as, as Peter intimated about, um, about the, um, uh, the, 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 the Glasgow Declaration, which just, just blew, blew, me, blew me away. But there's also an educational piece there, because you'll know in six out of 10 kids don't know where fresh produce comes from, probably let, let alone how uh, plants work in, in some respects to uh, solving this, 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 this carbon crisis. So farming accounts for quite a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Do you think farms can adapt to be less carbon emitting? Should we stop eating meat per se and, and just, just eat uh, 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 plant-based uh, foods? Or, or is there a combination there? What's your advice, please? So, um, okay, it, 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 there's, there's a lot in that. You know, I'll try and unpack a little bit of it. Um, as far as um, the obvious, there's inputs and there's, there's outputs. So if you think of the inputs we're putting in, which are going to be causing problems, planetary problems, then of course we can use more biological systems where we utilize natural biological systems instead of manufacturing and synthesizing products from um, uh, resources that are finite. So the simplest example is nitrogen fertilizer. We should definitely be working to utilize the 74% of the atmosphere around us that is nitrogen. We can fix that into the ground with nitrogen fixing plants, for example. And with the crop rotations that include those plants in the crop rotation, that nitrogen can be made available without any need to synthesize it in a factory. So there's, there's some of your inputs that we can immediately reduce. The other question is outputs. What do, what do we do with our farming systems that actually release carbon? So for example, and you implied uh, animal farming. Sure, I mean, if you think about the inefficiency of growing lots of corn 
and then feeding it to animals. And I'm going to pick on the US if you don't mind. I'm yep. sorry for any Americans that are listening to this. But 95% of the US beef is produced from uh, corn. And that, to me, is one way of uh, damaging you know, the planet for us. On the other hand, if you take pastoral systems, where the actual number of animals is relatively low, but those pastoral systems uh, have um, diverse pastures in the farming rotation with low numbers of animals, there's no reason why you can't sequester a lot of carbon into the soil and still have some meat and dairy products. But like Pete said, yes, we have to consume less meat of the wrong production system, and we have to have a more balanced, more uh, diverse rotation with crops and animals within it to get the fertility. I worry very much that if we only had a crop system, that we would, we would struggle to drive the fertility that we need to produce those crops. Yeah. Um, Ian, and well said, and you, you don't have to dance around the, the Americans. We did a bro- broadcast a couple of weeks ago with a great group, uh, United Fresh, and uh, they represent 55,000 fresh produce uh, uh, companies out there. And uh, on the panel I was on, they, were, they stated that all, the, all of us Americans are too fat. One of the reasons is we're eating far too much meat. It shouldn't be uh, readily available. It should be better meat. It shouldn't be high, highly processed. Um, and th- therefore, uh, the consumer would uh, eat more fresh produce. And so we, we could create an equilibrium. So, so everyone, can you just come 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 back in? Because we just moved to the, the Q and A session. As, as everyone's coming in, um, uh, Ian, economics. Um, why are economics most important to farmers? What, why not environmental wildlife? I'd be interested to see what everyone else thinks. Ian, what do you think? Ah, great question. Um, okay, so look, economics are are the driver. If you're a commercial farmer, like running any commercial business, you have to be in the black before you can go to the green. And there's no getting away from that. You know, I know loads of, of very commercial farmers, very good producers, but unless they're making a money to pay their bills, they're not going to exist for very long. Clearly, the game has changed. Environmental concerns and wildlife delivery running alongside nature instead of trashing it uh, is now the new order of the day. So economics are a prerequisite but they have to work in parallel. And my point would be on this, I think, you know, farmers, yes, they have responsibility, but they also have to make a living to be there. So I I argue very strongly that you have to have money from the system funding farmers' work. Now, if they want to rewild, if they want to uh, produce, you know, livestock or produce crops in a sympathetic way alongside nature, And if that means that we have less yield or we have to sacrifice some of the cheaper foods that we're producing, then we as a society have to support them in that. It's clear to me that we have to do that. That doesn't say it's more expensive food, by the way. That just implies that there's a change required that needs funding. And the best way to make change is from policy, is from demand. And we at the moment neither have the policy nor do we have the demand, but we're beginning to wake up And we desperately need to find ways of driving the demand for change on farm. Because believe you me, there are tens of thousands of farmers in this country and and tens and hundreds of thousands around the world who will change very readily tomorrow because they know they're depleting their most precious natural resource, which is the soil. And they want to rebuild it. And that regeneration, that regenerative farming that you spoke about, absolutely, that's where we should be going. Ian, thank you. Mark, what, what's your takeaway from from those those three conversations with Carolina, with 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 Pete and Ian? For, for, for me, it's that we must engage with Carolina and the, and the Carbon Trust. With Pete, we must uh, assist as much as we can as a sector, and also see if we can uh, promote more the Glasgow uh, Declaration. And with uh, with Ian, it's to, to go go visit his his amazing farm. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, well, well, to me, it's uh, the underinvestment in regenerative uh, agro agro ecological agricultural systems moving away from a very extract, extractive productivist system. Uh, uh, and to me, um, you know, I think all of them have said it, you know, regenerative agricultural systems. Yes, they regenerate. They should be regenerating soils. They should be putting carbon back into the uh, to the system, regenerating biodiversity. But to me, regenerative systems are more than just soils and the environment. We have to look at the environmental dimensions. Ian has just mentioned the economic dimensions. So farmers, 
um, have to get that economic return and be incentivized for those um, uh, systems. Uh, and thirdly, there has to be a social dimension. So, so we can't ignore health, for example. Health and nutrition is the third pillar of what I would call a regenerative agricultural system. We have to be um, tackling uh, the human health crisis, the obesity crisis, moving away from foods with empty calories to nutrient rich foods. You could produce lots of foods with empty calories sustainably and even regeneratively from a, uh, from a kind of farming system. But um, if they're bad for our health, then you have to question the production of those foods. So, so health, economics and environmental are all three dimensions of, of regenerative agroecological systems in my view. Mark, thank you. Barbara, your view? I'm just smiling there because we started at the top of the hour talking about what we'd like to drink in a pub and then Mark just eloquently said that we shouldn't be having food with empty calories and it's just... Uh, it's just kind of... your pleasure. I'm a Guinness man. So, you know, in moderation, you know, taste is a big driver. We all like the odd luxury, but ultra-processed foods shouldn't be driving our food system as they are today. So apologies to the uh, alcohol industry. <laughs> We've just decided that they don't need to exist except to in really small quantities. But a couple of the take homes for me, I was really intrigued by what everyone's been saying so far. And one of the things that stuck out for me was around COP26 and how if, you know, food and agriculture is contributing so much to greenhouse gases, why is it not higher up on the agenda? Why are we not giving... It, the attention it deserves to really make a change. And I think it's about having a multidisciplinary approach to everything. You can't exclude one thing or say it's not as important when actually its impact is really important. So that's, that's one clear thing. And from what Carolina was saying, I was intrigued again because it's about how we engage with food and farming businesses to look at how things are measured. And we don't necessarily have all that consistency in measurement and monitoring. Because if we don't have that, it means it's very difficult for us to change it. And I think until we do have that, that consistency in measuring and definition, we're going to be like VHS and Betamax from the old days where everyone's trying to, you know, champion a different brand, for example, a way of doing things. It's not consistent. We're not comparing apples with apples. So I do think we need to, to pin ourselves to at least one flag and say, right, this is how we're going to measure all these different metrics and do it consistently as an industry so we can benchmark and we can see what doing you know different interventions how that makes it easier for us and how that makes us able to achieve what we want to get to which is you know, whether it's net zero or whether we start inching forward with the carbon neutrality but we need to make improvements and finally from Ian you know it's just really encouraging to hear that yes we we take time and we we learn how different systems are applicable in different places. And not all countries have to do everything the same way. Some countries will have to make changes more than others. But, you know, it doesn't mean that we have to stop eating animal protein. It just means that the way in which everything is harmonized has to be better balanced. So some good take homes from, me, from the panelists today. Jackie. Yeah, I, I think this is really interesting. The whole reason the three of us came together was to have forums like this where you had actors together who aren't perhaps necessarily assembled together. And actually, our three actors today are probably assembled together. But what we need to, to recognise is that none of this is going to happen unless the whole thing's put together as the whole jigsaw puzzle from the get-go, because the risk is over here we'll do something that's motivated by good reason but over there you know that whole point that somebody made around biodiversity so this is this is a call to arms but this is a different call to arms to the ones we're normally we're normally sort of sitting um ending these conversations with and i think that that fundamentally that that piece around uniformity that piece around this isn't competitive advantage this is just the right thing to do so mm -hmm. having uniformity in the way that we measure things and and i guess a limp, sort of avoiding that sort of drag which inevitably will happen into this sort of carbon offsetting scheme commerciality and actually digging our heels in and saying no it's not about just the commercial realization of what carbon could be worth 
but also recognizing, as Mark's just said, growers and farmers know the value of, of good uh, practice. They've been custodians and stewards of the countryside heroically for years. So give them some credit, back them and give them the, the tools to do this um, in the most appropriate way. Um, roundtable way rather than the risk of it all being sort of picked off and and, and commercialised ultimately. So that's my thoughts. Jack, Jackie, well done. And, and Peter, we've, we've got some great questions um, in. One that came in, which I'm just, just going to present over to yourself, Peter, and then over to Ian. How do you feel international adoption of food systems will be best achieved? Will international cooperation help or will it be a more gradual development in local governments? So as, as, you, as you mentioned earlier about the Glasgow Declaration, what, what's your thought? Is, is, there, is there going to be this moratorium that's going to come out from COP26 or will local governments, will local countries, local countries, countries take, take their own view of it and to try and create change? What do you think, please, Pete? Yeah, most of the change will happen um, at member state level, but it's got to have an international framework to work with. But the, the cities, local government has got huge powers in this agenda and, and people who want to see change in the system need to also be talking to their local governments about change because that's where, that's where the food's eaten. 70% of the food is eaten in the cities. So I like to think of this, you know, we used to do those three-legged races in the old days when we could get together and not do social distancing. And if you think of farmers and citizens, right, as the two people, right, but their legs are tied together. And the way that they go forward depends on how those legs are tied together, right? And those legs are tied together by the way the market works, the rules of engagement, the price of carbon, the fact that we don't cost in externalities like nature depletion. That, that's, the, that's the things that bind those two legs together. And they need to go forward in a certain direction, but we need to get the way their legs are tied together to work differently, right? Otherwise, everybody falls over. What a fantastic analogy. Ian, thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I'd go, um, yeah, I, I, I get that and, and I agree. Um, I want to just tell you a little bit about what's happening where I am uh, on a very sort of local level. Um, so a few years ago, um, a number of us were talking around um, producing grains, heritage grains that would have deeper roots that would be more mineral rich going, uh, you know, back to those points that uh, were made uh, earlier on. And um, one way of doing that is to uh, is to grow, you know, uh, uh, old grains, which is fine. And a lot of people are doing it, but it's very dis disjointed. Um, and what we've done locally is we've had a number of farmers come together, uh, a miller come together, um, a baker, um, and, all, and, all, and all the people with knowledge around that. And just by... Um, thinking locally, um, we seem to have been no doubt running along in parallel with other regions, other, other people in other countries doing similar things. It, it, it does get a bit competitive. Um, there is no doubt at all that uh, you have to park up your ego on these things and in order to make progress. And that clashes a little bit with um, for profit businesses. But um, when it does come together, it's incredibly powerful. And, you know, it really can make a big difference, actually, because, as Pete said with a three-legged example, you know, you are really strong together. And it's, um, I'm not suggesting that this is the way for everybody, but I think cooperation, thinking differently about, you know, um, leaving individual, individualism behind a little bit and, and finding areas that you can collaborate, it makes you much stronger. So, for example, you know, we could, uh, a farm could grow, go back to the wheat example, could grow heritage wheat. But it will then end up in the commoditized basket because um, there is no differential between it. And going back to the certification or the, 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 um, you know, the accreditation, or however you want to look at this, unless you have some form of evidence that this is a, uh, a, um, a, better, a better system and that it can be proven to come from that system, it won't go anywhere. So I think certification or something like it is going to be necessary. But the problem is, as soon as you move away from a locality, you run into all these different things. So, for example, regenerative agriculture is not a term used in France, as an example. Yeah, OK, OK. Uh, Car Carolina, with the Carbon Trust, um, uh, do, do you have to, have you got a solution that fits one and all, whether it be uh, cities or, or countries? Or do you find that you're, you're having to spend a lot of time educating individual countries, individual um, uh, uh, communities, ind individual in industry groups. How does it work with the Carbon Trust? Um, there is, yeah, there is definitely differences. There's not a one size fits all um, solution. There is obviously the underlying principles of, of measuring carbon, of, of quantifying it, of reporting it are similar, but 
the policy context, the the kind of the different consumer pressures, the the drivers in in every context are very different. So the priorities that every that every um, company we work with will have, or every local government or local authority, they're very different. So it is very much about understanding those main drivers and understanding what every um, every client, company, government, um, whoever wants to get out of the process of understanding what their emissions are and communicating them to different stakeholders. I think that's the, that's the key um, to, to understand those differences. Okay, Carolina, for the Carbon Trust, I've just given you a magic wand. You're going to wave that magic wand and you're going to create the success of all of us um, going towards carbon neutrality. What do you want to happen? What, what needs to happen in, in the views of the, the Carbon Trust, please? So I think what's kind of underlying everything is transparency and openness. So what we really need is we need much more, we need primary data, we need we need every player to talk to to others to understand what are the biggest barriers, how can everyone work together, how can we together achieve our goals. And for that, we just need the transparency and the openness to say what's going well, what do we know, what don't we know yet, um, where, where are our biggest issues and, and who can help us with that. So I think that would be um, the underlying driver for all of this to, to happen. Fantastic. Pete, I'm, go- I'm going to give you this proverbial magic wand as, as we're just coming up to the the witching hour and I've put another pound in the, in the slot to allow us to, to go for another five minutes. Pete, what, what do you want to see to create this success uh, for the likes of COP26, for, for the likes of the Glasgow Declaration? What's going to make you happy five, ten years out, please? Um, what's going to make me happy is that we have more dialogues between farmers and their cities that we have stronger regional food systems. Post-COVID, what's happened is the world's woken up and gone. Why is it that we have a system where everybody grows food to sell to somebody else and then everybody buys food from a long way away? You know, we've And that system's been established now globally, wherever you go. So we're talking this morning to indigenous farmers in the Philippines who were selling their crops and then buying hot dogs from the local shop. Now they're using new technology to turn their traditional crops into not just nutritious food, but as Ian says, tasty food that the kids want to eat. That's a very sort of concrete example of the sort of change we want to see where we we stop having these long food chains, extractive food systems, and we start to really collectively understand the value of food for our health, for our communities, and for our planet. And that change is coming. But, you know, what, what we'll see at COP is some language being spoken, some terms being used, some people making connections with each other and building that movement for change that, that Ian and others are, are so engaged in. Pete, thank you. Ian, success. What, what, do you, what will make you happy five, 10 years out, please? Well, it's knowledge exchange. It's all about getting, you know, talking a language that people understand. Um, there's been a few references today about, you know, not people to be disconnected in cities. And, you know, this is so important and, and I totally get it. So for me, I am not a fan of genetic uh, engineering. I'll just make that clear. Um, but I would be a fan of um, you know, crossing Stormzy with David Attenborough because I think that's the sort of person that we need now is somebody to come and tra- champion this, uh, these ideas going forwards to a wide audience because unless we get wide-scale adoption, these things will just be little bubbles in the countryside which will go no further as far as I can see. So it's about communication. Jackie, what, what, what's going to make you happy about, about creating success on this subject five, ten years out? I love the idea of Stormzy and David Attenborough. I, I think that's it. It feels like the, the sort of awareness building through um, COP and and um, Greta and Extinction Rebellion. You know, we've got this sort of boiling pot of people really engaged. We know from reports around COVID what what impact the environment and disrespect in the environment is having. And it just feels like, that you know, this is a world stage and somebody needs to be brave enough to, to speak who, who um, people respect and listen to. And, and I keep coming back to this, this thing around it not being a competitive um, advantage. It's just the right thing to do. And so the idea of, you know, yeah, leave your ego at the door. This is, this is bigger than any of you. You know, that, that for me is a big thing. Yeah, this is wake up time. Mark, your thoughts, please. I suppose it's about all of us, whether we're citizens, farmers, businesses, coming together to advocate, you know, for a policy shift. That's the missing piece of the jigsaw, uh, in my view. 
the UK government now you know, has an opportunity in a post-Brexit world, whether you support it or not. We are now, now post-Brexit. Uh, the government has to introduce the environmental land management scheme. I think by 2024, they'll be piloting that towards the end of this year. Let's really reward farmers for uh, regenerative agroecological practices. And hopefully, in terms of the, the wedding that, that Pete referred to of, of COP26, the government, UK government and other governments can take that through through what they're calling national determined contribution. So national government's plans to put food systems a bit more front and centre of those nationally determined uh, contributions moving forward. Mark, thank you. Barbara, would you like to summarise for us? I would. Fortunately for me, a lot of it has been said, but I do think it's important that we don't sit and wait for policy change. We use the tools that everyone's spoken about, so being connected, using knowledge exchange, benchmarking and finding out what the best practices are and putting them into each of our businesses and our homes rather than waiting to be told by national governments what to do because they are behind the curve on this one. And we can engage with what's happening in our cities and environments very, very quickly and see what's happening and, and learn from it very quickly. Barbara, well said. So what, what have we learnt from this, uh, this amazing broadcast with three more amazing experts. Carolina, we have to follow her and the Carbon Trust um, and engage with them uh, on, on an agri and, and, a, and a fresh producer basis. So if it's, if it's okay, Carolina, we'll, we'll promote your, your website and if people want to link in with you on LinkedIn, hopefully that's, a, that's okay as well. Uh, Pete, I, I think what, what you stated is it's just an absolute masterclass. And I've learned so much from you, especially in the respect of the, the, the city element and the and the Glasgow decoration. So anything that we can do as a sector to help, well again we'll put your links on all of the of the media that we'll push out on the on the back of this. And um, fingers crossed, let's see what happens off the back of a uh, COP26. And and Ian, I, I think as I said earlier, I, I um, I wish I had you. I wish I could have worked, worked with you when I was in the grain trade because I, I perhaps would have done more good as you've done um, uh, over your 30, 40 years within, within the sector. So to our founders of Barbara, Jackie and Mark, well done again for getting three amazing experts to create this conversation. Let, let's create this conversation. Let's not be part of this conversation. And let's see if we, we can take away from this the learnings to make a difference and do what needs to to be done it's not in some ways it's not about being doing doing good it's, it's what has to be done as, as pete um intimated um in, in our interview everyone thank you very much for your time keep safe and uh, let's see what happens later on in the year with cop 26 keep safe and be well thank you max thanks everyone bye 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 <laughs>